Well, hello, welcome to our service here at Christchurch. I'm David Hall, the vicar here. Just one or two announcements before our service gets underway. Uh, first of all, our tea concert, our Advent tea concert takes place next Sunday afternoon, the 28th of November. Last few tickets are on sale, so do grab those. Um, our soloist, uh, Katie Drahern, was the lead in the Phantom of the Opera in London's West End. So um, very, very worth hearing. She's a lovely Christian as well, so it should be a really uplifting time. Uh, we're doing our Christmas card drop on Saturday, the day before, the 27th of November. We're not going to be actually talking on, on people's doorsteps for COVID reasons, but we will be doing a drop-off of cards. So if you feel able to deliver some cards uh, on that date or around that date, please pick up a stack of cards in the foyer uh, and mark on the list where you'll be delivering them to. So do drop in to do that. Uh, we'll also have a big presence at the Chorleyward Christmas sort of late opening uh, for the shops in the centre of Chorleyward. That's on the evening of Friday, the 3rd of December. So if you can help out, help out with chatting to people or facilitating a little simple children's craft that we're going to be doing from mid-afternoon right through to early evening on Friday, the 3rd of December, we'd love to hear from you. Um, also, our Tuesday drop-in on Tuesday afternoons after school goes from strength to strength. If you know any teenagers who might be wandering back from school around about that time, we'd love them to come along and join us. It's just really informal drop-in. There's some mellow games and stuff. Wonderful way of connecting with young people in our community. And that's every Tuesday in term time. Uh, we're building up our tech team as well. Um, we need a couple of people to help us as we begin to resource ready for live streaming. Um, so uh, do let us know if you might be a little bit technical or be prepared to become technical. We'll give you all the training you need. And last but not least, um, check out Church Suite, which got loads of details of all the things that are going on as well as our website. And do remember to give financially to support the work and witness of the church family. Never has the witness and hope of the Christian truth be needed more than now. So it's brilliant to have your prayers, your practical support and your giving to make that possible. Great to have you with us. Our service begins shortly. See you in church. Welcome to our 8.30 communion service, wherever in the world you may be. My name's Graham Naylor-Smith. Please remain standing for our opening prayer. We say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may truly love you and worthily praise your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please do sit down. We come now to our prayers of penitence. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There are no other commandments greater than these. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy on us and incline our hearts to keep your laws. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue now in prayer. And so we now come to the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Right, we come now to our Bible reading, which is from um, Colossians, uh, the first letter of Paul, sorry, the letter of Paul, uh, to the Colossians. And it's chapter 1, beginning at verse 24. We'll be looking at verses 24 to 29. I'll give you a little time just to find that before I read it for you. Colossians chapter 1, beginning at uh, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up whatever is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray that God will help us as we open this holy word of his and uh, he will open our eyes and give us great insight and wisdom as to how we should respond let us pray oh loving lord we thank and praise you for uh, this narrative thank you for this letter written to the early church at a time of change and also of turbulence and conflict we pray that you will help us to better understand the times in which we live and also how christ and the power of the Holy Spirit may speak to us and may equip us, guard and keep us in these times. Uh, this we ask for the glory of your name. Amen. 
Amen. Well, do keep that passage open in front of you, Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 24. The pandemic has changed everything. Uh, one of the less documented effects of, uh, of, the, of COVID has been that uh, how it infects clothes uh, and it makes them shrink. Uh, without me even catching the virus, it has infested my wardrobe, it's made my shirts a touch snug. And I read an article by a journalist on Thursday who commented on this phenomenon and he said the fault clearly lies in our genes. Yeah, too right, they don't fit anymore, they're too tight. So there are many things that have changed as a result of the pandemic. That's a new one to me. On a more serious note, the pandemic has changed a lot of things. Some of us have lost loved ones. Um, it's certainly changed how we celebrate or, or mourn life events. It's changed our social interaction with others. It's changed our holiday plans, our work patterns, even where we live. A lot of things have changed and may be different forever going forward into the future. So we're looking at Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 24 to 29, under the title, How Does Faithful Discipleship Change Everything? Not just some things, not just some things temporarily, but how does it change everything? That's no small claim. We're coming to the last in our discipleship series, and we're looking at these key verses from Colossians. Um, the uh, Colossians was written uh, as a letter around about 60 AD. It was written by Paul during his first imprisonment in Rome. He'd heard that heresies had appeared in the church uh, at Colossae, and uh, he writes to refute them. I think it's worth reminding ourselves that when people stand up, even perhaps uh, senior figures stand up and cast doubt over the well-established doctrines of the church, there's nothing new in that. Ever since the church was established, there's never been a shortage of people standing up and asking, did God really say? Did God really say? And of course, that phrase is a direct quote from Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, and it comes from the mouth of the serpent. For every new generation, the evil one has a new heresy. It starts perhaps in fashionable circles outside the church, and it sometimes drifts towards fashionable circles inside the church. Now, we're not actually told the precise nature of the heresy at Colossae. Um, and um, when Scripture's open-ended like this, it's for a d divinely decided reason. It's often so that women get strung up on the precise nature of that particular heresy, which in itself would not be massively healthy. It's often because we should look and we should learn about the principles involved, the divine response. Having said that, circumstantial evidence suggests that the heresy at Colossae was related either to Jewish exclusiveness or the invasion of some pagan mystery religion. And the challenges of these two heresies still hold true today. Most of the wrong thing, thinking that we have within a church family comes either from a wrong view of ourselves and how exclusively good we are, or a wrong view of wisdom outside Christian truth and dangerous attempts somehow to change our thinking, to fit that of the world outside rather than to challenge it with the Word of God. Why does heresy matter? Why cannot our faith change or evolve like the English language, for example? I mean, if you talk to anyone under the age of uh, 15, they will assure you that they were like talking to their friend, like yesterday, while they were sat waiting for their lesson to begin on how best to split their infinitives. Now, I think we all think that, well, we all agree, that's a brilliant innovation in the English language, which will serve us well in years to come. But Christian belief is not like language, which modifies continually. It is a pattern for eternity. It is revealed once for all for God's people. So heresy matters because it distorts that. It distorts our view of sin. It distorts our view of humanity. It distorts our view of Christ. So Paul's tackling heresy here, and he's giving a true view of humanity from Scripture, a true view of sin, and a true view of Christ. If we have a true view of these things, we are in a strong position to stand in turbulent times. This letter's not a rant. Uh, Paul writes with clarity and compassion. There's a measured tone to it. And I think this extract is a compelling read. 
So how does faithful discipleship, faithful to Scripture, faithful to Christ, uh, change everything? Well, first of all, it brings meaning to spiritual suffering. It affects, if you like, the present. Now, suffering itself can take many forms. I mean, if we're in constant pain, I'm not going to make glib comments about how that might somehow be of benefit. It might well be just a case of gritting our teeth and with God's help getting through it. But for the believer, there's always a spiritual dimension to suffering. I was talking to a young person earlier this week who was uh, being mocked at school for attending church. Uh, now, interesting enough, their friends piled in and said, oh, we've been to that church, it's really cool. <laughs> but for them, to be singled out in that way so negatively when they most desired, more than anything else, to fit in with their peer group was embarrassing. Now, Paul here is in prison for spiritual reasons. This is a much higher level, isn't it, in terms of suffering. This is the other end of the scale. And yet he says these surprising words, verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. How could he rejoice in suffering? And how could, how could there possibly be anything lacking in Christ's afflictions? Surely the agony of Christ on the cross was complete. No one suffered more than he did. I think what Paul's saying here is that as Christ suffered, so the church must suffer. And if the church suffers for Christ, that is suffering as the body of Christ. It is completion of the Father's plan for the Son that the church should suffer also. And it, we should suffer. In other words, it's a privilege to suffer for and with Christ. And the church is privileged. It's a different way of viewing difficulty and discouragement, particularly in our Christian work. They're part of the completion of the sufferings of Christ. And if Paul can rejoice in prison, how much more the faithful disciple of Christ should rejoice anywhere. So faithful discipleship brings meaning to present spiritual suffering. Faithful discipleship also affects the past. It reveals spiritual truth previously hidden. Now, for many people, life's a pretty vague spiritual search, isn't it? The former Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, uh, once revealed that he received this letter in the post, and it was addressed, Jesus in heaven. And the post office had scribbled on it, try Lambeth Palace, try Lambeth Palace. Now, I don't know that that cleared things up, but Paul is describing his role here as the completion of the spiritual search, which previously lasted for thousands of years. And this is what he says in verse 25. I became a minister according to the church from God that was given to me for you to make known the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And again, we might wonder here, are we getting into dangerous territory here? I mean, if Paul's role in verse 25 is to make the word of God fully known, where does that leave Jesus? What's going on here? How, how could Paul make known something which Jesus had not made fully known himself? Well, a few things here. First of all, until Jesus was revealed as Messiah, he was hidden. Old Testament prophecy pointed to him. But faithful prophets and believers of the Old Testament, they died without physically meeting Jesus. Hebrews 11, verse 39, uh, uh, 40, uh, at the end of a whole list of faithful people in the Old Testament, says this, And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us. Just think what that means. For thousands and years, kings and prophets must have stood on the roofs of their palaces, staring into the night sky, looking at countless millions of stars across the sky and wondering, maybe tonight God will send to his people a saviour, a messiah. And then one night, a star does appear, brighter than all the others, and three of them follow it, all the way to the newborn infant, Jesus Christ. He is the culmination of all our searching. Secondly, also in terms of making a known something not fully known, 
as Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave this final instruction, Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Jesus is knowing that as he is ascending to heaven, he is leaving most of the world yet to be reached by the church. And here we are at Christ Church. We have mission partners. We have people who, who go out from Christ Church to serve as missionaries all over the world, and we support them as part of the fulfillment of our discipleship and our responsibility to the world at large. But we also have responsibilities to our parish, the immediate neighbors. Next Saturday, we're going to get a chance to get personally involved. We're going to be dropping Christmas cards with service invitations. We won't be talking to people on the door because of the COVID thing. We're going to just drop them through the letterbox. It could not be easier. We're going to be going to thousands of homes in our parish. Now, interestingly enough, as our parish becomes more multicultural, God is bringing the world to our door. It has never been easier for church members, ordinary church members, to be global missionaries for Christ. How much easier does God need to make it before we do it? We'll also uh, be issuing an electronic survey across our church family, asking everyone to get personally involved in serving in the run-up to Christmas, when the opportunities are enormous, and beyond into the new year, as things begin to open up. Discipleship is the individual contribution that we make to the collective contribution of the church family to spreading the good news to the next street, to the next country, and to the world. So our role is to reveal Jesus to the world, spiritual truth previously hidden. Finally, faithful discipleship changes our future and it prepares us for judgment. Verse 28, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Now there's an edge to this. There's a warning. The word warning means that God's judgment is to be respected. To be respected. And if you have not yet come in repentance and faith to Jesus Christ, do not delay a minute longer. You are living in great danger. But primarily Paul's motivation is positive, that he may present all those in the early church, even those a little bit tempted or distracted by the latest heresy, he may present them mature in Christ to God the Father on the day of judgment. And that's worth the work. Here's a testimony from Operation Mobilization. It's an amazing organization. It sends ships all over the world to spread the good news and help with relief efforts and all kinds of things. And they released this testimony last week from a lady called Christina, whose faith journey, I think, spans all the extremes from a million miles away from uh, uh, the living God uh, to mature in Christ. She said this, I grew up in a Muslim family. The very first time I heard about Jesus was 2010, but I felt extremely embarrassed because of my sins, and I ran away from God. After 10 years living an immoral life, I strongly felt in my heart that I needed to be closer to God. However, I was seeking the wrong God, I started to focus more and more on Islam and studying the Quran. I began praying five times a day, turning to face the right direction, praying in certain ways, but I couldn't find peace. In 2020, through the testimony and prayers of my older Christian sister, I gave my life and heart to Jesus. She said this, back in 2010, when for the first time I heard about Jesus, I turned my back on him, but he has never turned his back on me. The God of the Bible, she said, waited for me for 10 years to dress me in his holiness and grace. What an amazing observation on the work of God. How long have you kept God waiting when he is ready to cover the embarrassment of your sin and to dress you in his holiness and his grace? So in conclusion, how does faithful discipleship change everything? It changes the present, bringing meaning to present spiritual suffering. It changes the past, revealing spiritual truth previously hidden. And it changes the future, 
removing the fear and the embarrassment of sin and clothing us in the holiness and grace of Christ. I'm glad that the Apostle Paul was faithful to his calling, but what about you? Let's start getting ready to be presented fully mature to God the Father. And in the words of verse 29, toil with all his energy that he powerfully works within you because faithful discipleship changes everything. Let's take a few moments of personal prayer and reflection, and then I shall pray. Loving Lord, thank you for these words of encouragement and challenge. Help me to recognize that faithful discipleship is within reach and that I should not be distracted by anything. May your Holy Spirit visit me now in power and bring meaning to present suffering, reveal spiritual truths previously hidden, and prepare me to be presented fully mature through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. Amen. And we now say the Nicene Creed together and affirm our faith. Together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, universal and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, we come now to the peace and there will be a short pause at the end of it for you to greet those around you or if you're on your own, to offer your thanks to God for friends and loved ones. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Well, let's share with one another a sign of the peace. Well, we now come to the Eucharistic prayer and its joyful opening responses to our risen Lord. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise. Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God. Therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. 
Hosanna in the highest. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself, once offered, a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray and grant that we, receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. Well, we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. So draw near with faith. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And we say together, we do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. The body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you, keep you in eternal life. And we say together the prayer after the communion. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. 
Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us. So we and all your children shall be free. And the whole earth live to praise your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, in a moment, we'll come to our final song in which we'll take our offering to support the work and witness of our church family to this parish and through our mission partners far afield. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been so meaningful to remember the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I trust that your faith has been strengthened by this morning's message and this act of remembrance. And do use the social media or email to send your greetings and best wishes and spiritual thoughts and encouragements to one another. And please also email the office with any testimonies you have of God's help or answers to prayer. It's always such an encouragement to hear from you. And if you're outside the UK, do please mention the country you're in if you're able to do so. We are a global community and we are one in Christ. And so we come to our final blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And the blessing of God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and those you love now and evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>